on World News Tonight. The Eagle has landed. Donald Trump arrives in New York prior to his appearance before the Grand Jury of New York. Dhaka ablaze. Major fire breakout at a popular clothing market in the Bangladeshi capital. New member. Finland is set to become the NATO's 31st member as Sweden keeps fighting for its position. And Garden of Bliss. Sunshine's Garden Expo opens to the public after 10 years. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are watching World News. We start off tonight in the South Asian region. A fire erupted in Banga Bazaar market in Dhaka city in Bangladesh as firefighters rushed to spot to douse the flame. Hundreds of firefighters have been mobilized in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, to battle a huge fire that raged through a popular clothing market and blanketed the city's oldest neighborhoods in black smoke. No casualties from the Tuesday morning blaze have been reported yet. Shop owners and fire officials told reporters that the Bongo Bazaar market and three adjacent commercial precincts had been almost completely gutted. Most of the shops were burnt to ashes in the fire, but there was no information on whether any people were trapped inside, given that the fire broke in the early hours of the morning before most shops had opened. The market is a popular destination for cut-price Western fashion brands such as Tommy Hilfiger, selling clothes that were produced in the city's garment factories but failed to meet export standards. Smoke engulfed the area and flames were seen rising from the complex, hampering rescue efforts. Shopkeepers in Banga Bazaar, which houses mostly cloth stores, had stocked up in preparation for the festival of Eid, but most of their goods were destroyed in the fire. Lax regulations and poor enforcement have been blamed for industrial fires in the country that have in recent years led to hundreds of deaths. Now, Donald Trump arrived in New York City a day before he is due for a hotly anticipated court appearance where he'll respond to the first ever criminal indictment filed against a former American president. Former U.S. President Donald Trump arrived in New York City on Monday walking into Trump Tower ahead of his historic arraignment on Tuesday to face charges stemming from a probe into hush money paid to a porn star before the 2016 election. Security was high outside the Manhattan courthouse where Trump is likely to be fingerprinted and photographed Tuesday afternoon. At a news conference, New York City Mayor Eric Adams warned protesters to behave themselves or face the consequences. Uh, while there may be some rabble-rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. As always, we will not allow violence or vandalism of any kind. And if one is caught participating in any act of violence, they will be arrested and held accountable, no matter who you are. There he is! Trump left his Florida home midday Monday to cheering supporters as his motorcade drove by to take him to his private plane at the airport, which flew him to New York. The Republican who's seeking to regain the presidency in 2024 is the first sitting or former U.S. president to face criminal charges. A grand jury voted to indict him last week. Trump was due to surrender at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office on Tuesday before appearing before a judge where he's expected to plead not guilty. The specific charges have yet to be disclosed. Trump has said he's innocent and his allies have portrayed the charges as politically motivated. The Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who's leading the prosecution, is a Democrat. Trump is expected to fly back to Florida after Tuesday's arraignment and deliver primetime remarks at his Mar-a-Lago estate. Meanwhile, China ratchets up its arms protests around Taiwan to show its discontent over Taiwanese president's overseas trip. More threats are expected as Tsai Ing-wen is set to meet with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy amid increasing U.S.-China rivalry. Taiwan's president is currently in Central America for a 10-day trip aimed at shoring up ties with allies, and China is not happy. China's People's Liberation Army Eastern Theater Command said in a press release on Sunday that it recently carried out intensive maritime and air drills close to Taiwan. The drills are apparently in retaliation for Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen's planned meeting with Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. 
The leader is expected to meet with McCarthy in Los Angeles on her way back to Taipei later this week. Last Wednesday, China threatened retaliation if the meeting were to take place. Should the leader of Taiwan engage with the Congress Speaker McCarthy during her transit in the U.S., it will be another provocation that seriously violates the One China principle, damages China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and undermines peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. We firmly oppose this and will take resolute countermeasures to fight back. Speaking to the Global Times, Chinese military expert Fu Qianxiao said if the meeting goes ahead, China will respond in a way similar to when then-U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in August 2022. During Pelosi's meeting, China staged live fire drills around the island and stepped up military provocations. This time around, the experts said possible measures include large-scale exercises and combat patrols. Tsai arrived in Belize on Sunday afternoon following a three-day visit to Guatemala where she offered more cooperation. China and Taiwan are vying for influence in Latin America as Beijing does not allow other countries to maintain diplomatic relations with Taipei at the same time under the One China Principle. Taiwan is currently left with only 13 countries that recognize it as a sovereign state as Beijing continues to try and convince those countries to also end diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Now, the EU's biggest economies have spent billions to alleviate the cost of living crisis, but it hasn't been enough to prevent some of the most extensive industrial, social and political tensions in decades. France is living through another period of street protests and widespread strikes, in particular against President Emmanuel Macron's plan to raise the retirement age. Planes, trains and buses came to a standstill as Germany endured its largest day in decades of industrial action in March. Higher food and energy prices have contributed to rampant inflation and continue to dent living standards in Europe as elsewhere, most especially for the lowest paid, according to Gregory Clays from the Brussels-based economic think tank Bruegel. If you're poor, generally the inflation that you face, the level of inflation that you face is actually higher because you spend more of your uh, your money on uh, on things that have uh, increased a lot, like energy, um, food, etc. The recent protests suggest many European workers have decided to fight to maintain their share of a shrinking economic pie. Their governments are already dealing with a number of challenges, including aging populations, tackling climate change the Ukraine conflict, and ending their over-reliance on Russian energy. All of that makes them less willing to grant hefty public sector pay increases. But unions insist Europe still generates enough wealth to stop wages from sliding behind inflation. Owen Tudor is deputy head of the International Trade Union Confederation based in Brussels. Wages are not keeping pace with either productivity or uh, or the cost of living. Um, and so a number of, of, of workers are taking action. They're coming off the back of the pandemic. Um, they're facing a uh, climate emergency and so on. So there are a lot of concerns in the labour market at the moment that are facing working people. Securing a solid pay raise has proved harder for workers in Europe than in the U.S., where post-lockdown labor shortages gave workers extra leverage. Gregory Clay is from Bruegel again. And so it's more difficult, I don't know, for uh, an Italian worker or a Spanish worker or a Greek worker to ask for a uh, for wage raise when, when there is still like uh, some, some, some unemployed people. Um, while in the U.S., it's not the case. In, U in the U.S., Workers have, have increased their bargaining power, while this is not yet the case in Europe, so it manifests itself through, through this social unrest. The bump in European corporate profits and shareholder gains has also aggravated a sense of inequality. Union advocates like Owen Tudor say Europe's besieged governments could easily rebalance things through what might be politically unpopular steps, like raising taxes for the wealthy. Governments still seem to be trapped in the ideology um, that they can't raise taxes significantly and therefore they've uh, imposed on themselves 
an artificial uh, restriction on their ability to uh, to pay uh, higher wages. Um, and uh, there is still uh, a concern in some political circles about um, the level of public expenditure, the level of taxes, the level of, of public services. So there, we're still seeing attempts to drive down the social wage. This in particular, for instance, in terms of France, is about the pension entitlements. France is a rich country, and as a result of the productivity gains over the last 10 years, is easily able to maintain its pension arrangements at their current level uh, without having to, to do what President Macron is attempting to to do and that's that 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 doubles the uh, the anger among working people and that could mean more strikes in germany and protests and walkouts in france Malaysia's parliament has passed sweeping legal reforms to remove the mandatory death penalty, trim the number of offences punishable by death and abolish the natural life prison sentences. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Nevami Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Nevami? Yes, Sanuradi. Malaysia has had a moratorium on execution since 2018 when it first promised to abolish capital punishment entirely. Under the amendments passed on Monday, alternatives to the death penalty include whipping and imprisonment of between 30 to 40 years. The new jail term will replace all previous provisions that call for imprisonment for the duration of the offender's natural life. Life imprisonment sentences, defined by Malaysian law as a fixed term of 30 years, will be retained. Capital punishment will also be removed as an option for some serious crimes that do not cause death such as discharging and trafficking of a firearm and kidnapping, according to the new measures. The amendments passed apply to 34 offences currently punishable by death, including murder and drug trafficking. 11 of those carried as a mandatory punishment. More than 1,300 people facing the death penalty or imprisonment for natural life, including those who have been ex who have exhausted all other legal appeals can seek a sentencing review under the new rules. Dobby Chu, executive coordinator at the Anti-Death Penalty Asia Network, said the passing of amendments was a good first step towards total abolition of capital punishment. Back to you, Anuradi. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Nevami Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News on the other side. Welcome back. Now, Finland becomes the 31st member of NATO in a historic strategic shift provoked by Moscow's war on Ukraine, which doubles the US-led alliance's border with Russia. Last year, the Kremlin's all-out invasion of Ukraine upended Europe's security landscape and prompted Finland and its neighbor Sweden to drop decades of non-alignment. Finland will officially become NATO's 31st member state on Tuesday, marking the completion of a swift journey into the military alliance following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Nordic country has an 810-mile border with Russia, meaning NATO's frontier with Russia will roughly double in length. Finland had applied to join NATO alongside its neighbour Sweden as Russia's offensive in Ukraine intensified. The last hurdle to membership was removed last week when Turkey's parliament voted to ratify Helsinki's application, even as it kept Sweden's bid on hold. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg hailed the move as historic at a press conference in Brussels. We should not leave the impression in the way that, that, that Sweden is left alone. No, Sweden is very much inside NATO, uh, integrating into military and civilian structures. Allies are ready to act, and it's inconceivable uh, that there was any, that there were going to be any uh, threats or military attacks against uh, Sweden without. Uh, NATO reacting, and even more so with uh, Finland uh, as a full uh, member. Turkey and Hungary continue to hold up Sweden's membership. In response to the news of Finland's accession, Moscow vowed to beef up its forces in border regions. Finland's far-right leader claimed victory in a tight general election that saw the centre-right post a record score to come in second, as Prime Minister Sanna Marin's Social Democrats finished third. She led Finland towards NATO membership and became the world's youngest leader when she was elected Prime Minister in 2019. But now, age 37, Sanna Marin has lost her election bid. 
With 43 seats in Parliament, her Social Democrat Party has finished in third place, even though it made progress in relation to the 2019 result. Not in a very long time has an outgoing Prime Minister's party managed to increase their support in the number of seats. This is a brilliant achievement, although we did not come first today. Although polls show that Marin is still popular, she has faced criticism from Conservatives due to her spending on pensions and education, with the public debt reaching 73% of the country's GDP. The election was won by Pateri Orpo's right-wing National Coalition Party, which finished with a total of 48 out of 200 seats in Helsinki's parliament. A narrow victory, celebrated by the party's leader, who will now try to form a government. I can see that I'm very happy. This, this was a great victory for Kokomus. I think that Finnish people want change. They want change and now I will start negotiations, open negotiations with all parties. Orpo has promised to cut public spending by 6 billion euros in order to reduce Finland's debt. He could potentially form a coalition with San Marin, though this is unlikely. Or with the far-right party which finished in second place, this nationalist group which now holds 46 seats, is strongly anti-immigration. It will be several weeks or even months before a government is formed. Now on to another major story we're following at this hour. Most of the wildfires that broke out in South Korea over the weekend have been contained, but the biggest blaze in the central county of Hong Sung is spreading further due to strong winds prompting more residents to evacuate. On Sunday, more than 30 wildfires were reported to have broken out across South Korea. A quick and aggressive response from firefighters has contained most of them. But the Level 3 wildfire in Hongsong, Chungcheong, Namdo province remains ablaze for a third straight day. Some 19 helicopters and 1,784 personnel have been actively working to extinguish the fire, but are up against strong winds. Forest authorities are expected to add another 2,941 staff and 188 pieces of equipment on Tuesday. Two other Level 3 fires are being fought in Cholanamdo province. One in Hampyeong County, where the fire is presumed to have started on a bee farm. Strong winds have caused the fire to spread to a forest area close by and has spread quickly due to the recent dry weather. Damage from this fire include four factories, two stables and two greenhouses. 43 residents have been evacuated. The other level three fire in this province is in Suncheon County, where 89 residents have been evacuated so far. Forest authorities have reiterated that all efforts, from staff to equipment, will be distributed across the country as soon as possible. No casualties have been reported yet and some relief may be in sight as the country should see nationwide rain Tuesday evening. Nigeria's Naira currency hit a record low as the central bank grapples with dollar scarcity and a backlog of demand for foreign currency. This drop, according to financial analysts, is a forewarner of the potential banking crisis in the region. Nigeria's Naira currency dropped to a record low of 465 per dollar on Monday, data from Refinitiv showed. That's as traders await the outcome of Friday's central bank foreign exchange auction. The Naira later recovered to trade at 461 to the dollar. Soaring inflation and an unstable currency have been hampering Africa's biggest economy as it tries to recover from the global health crisis. Please take your cash. The Naira has fallen to successive lows due to dollar scarcity coupled with central bank adjustments to manage a backlog in demand for foreign exchange. On Friday, the central bank held a bi-weekly retail auction for people or businesses who need dollars to settle offshore trade-related obligations. The results are expected this Friday. Traders expect unsuccessful bidders to Friday's auction to channel their demand to informal sources. That's prompted the Naira to weaken to 750 against the dollar on the parallel black market. Nigeria's central bank is battling to manage liquidity on the interbank market while at the same time intervene on the foreign exchange market to prop up liquidity. It's been adjusting rates to manage demand against its level of foreign reserves. The United States Space Agency, or NASA, has unveiled the four-member crew for its upcoming mission around the moon, a team that includes the first woman, the first person of color, and the first Canadian assigned to a lunar mission.
Taking center stage today. Ladies and gentlemen, your Artemis II crew. NASA's next generation of lunar explorers. Commander Reed Weissman, pilot Victor Glover, mission specialist Christina Cook, and Canadian Jeremy Hansen. All of them accomplished NASA veterans. Am I excited? <laughs> Absolutely. Today, cheered on by fellow astronauts, family, NASA staffers. I'm so proud of you. And President Biden on Sunday. We'll make both of our nations, U.S. and Canada, proud in this mission. Americans left the moon in 1972 before any of these crew members were even born. Last November, Artemis 1 blasted off without anyone on board. A test flight around the moon. Artemis 2 will launch in late 2024. The Artemis 2 crew will travel in the Orion crew capsule, a 10-day mission that could take them almost 250,000 miles from Earth, the furthest humans have ever traveled. I'm most looking forward to paving the way for the future, back to the moon, on to Mars. If all goes as planned, Artemis 3 could return astronauts to the lunar surface later this decade, including a woman and person of color. As Apollo was synonymous with the 1960s, this is the Artemis generation. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Australia banned TikTok from all federal government-owned devices over security concerns, becoming the latest US-allied country to take action against a Chinese-owned video app. At least one person was killed and 30 injured, many seriously, when a passenger train carrying about 50 people derailed in the Netherlands. After hitting construction equipment on the track, Dutch emergency services said. British King Charles III visited an arrival center for Ukrainian refugees at the former Berlin airport Tegel. Charles, together with German President Frank Walter Steinmeier, met with refugees at the center and talked to helpers. Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit Holdings Warp.O filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after the satellite launch company failed to secure the long-term funding needed to help it recover from a January rocket failure. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now we leave you tonight with Sun Shum Man International Garden Expo in South Korea being brought back to life for the first time in 10 years. It's the biggest international event after the COVID pandemic, bustling with people and full of flowers. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.